where I grew up. It's another world from this one. My father was stuck in time a little bit. What was he like? He was religious. Just differently. Like, superstitious. South Park, y'all done around these parts. We're going up for my daddy's funeral. They don't get many visitors up in those hollers. You was in a plane accident. What about my family? Baby, you were the only one found. I need an ambulance. Ain't a hospital within 50 miles of here. Where you think you is? New York City. <laughs> this, it stands for you. Whatever happens to it, Happens to you. I'm gonna fix you. I'm gonna fix you good. Oh, All right now, tell us what you see. You may live in the city. But you for this land. I got big plans for you. Oh. I put a spell on you. They got my family. She controlling everyone in the town. Put you up. Put you down. for your own good. How did you get involved in this? I know that you have a history of working on both television and uh, theatrical projects. Mm -hmm. Was it your background in uh, suspense slash horror that got you this? Was it a relationship? How did you get involved? No, you know, I had, as you said, I had done, I sort, of, I sort of came from film and then sort of went into TV just because of the nature of the market, it all changed. Um, and I love doing TV and I've done some great shows, you know, you know, you know I really have. And, I've, and I've, met, I've met and worked with some of the best. And what I started to do was, um, I can't remember the first job I did it on, um, but I started to operate a lot. Uh, in fact, I, I'm on Lock and Key at the moment. I'm doing four episodes for Lock, Lock and Key and I'm operating um, on, on it. Um, and, um, and very much, it's all part of what I do now, you know? And so ever since I've sort of got into this, I've always kind of like tried to feel, try to sort of like develop a cinematic language that's unique to me, right? In, involving lenses and light and, mm -hmm. and, and, and operating. And, and I've been on this pilgrimage for ages and I've never sort of really got there. But, but a lot of these TV shows have allowed me to sort of operate on, you know, on the passage, they've offered, they let me operate, you know, not every day, but a couple of scenes, you know what I mean, when, when I want to step in. Um, but the problem with TV is, to some extent, you're kind of the vessel of someone else's creativity, really. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you push it as far as you can, but really it's the showrunner's show, right? Do you know what I mean? And that's how it is. And that's kind of nature of the beats, right? I'm not complaining about that. But very much, I wanted to kind of get ownership back again you know I wanted to be kind of instrumental to create a process and not incidental to it which sometimes you feel like you know so for me it was about getting back into film now anybody can make a film but getting distribution that's a very different thing right so you kind of want to have two, two of them together now the real truth is you know they're not going to hire me to make a studio film right they're not because they're going to go for the shiniest sort of jewel that they can find right you know or some some kid who's come from advertising or whatever it might be that's how they work right but also, frankly, my color, right? That's the real truth. I couldn't say this before the summer of discontent, but now I can say it. And I can say it with authority because I don't care if people think I got a chip on my shoulder, I don't. I don't care if people think I'm not good enough because I am. So now I can say it with all sort of like, you know, with all kind of like a form of sort of freeness really. And it's very hard, right? So really the only work I'm gonna get in film is at a certain cost point. And if it's black, that's the truth, mm. right? 
Okay. And it's interesting because, I, like I said, I look at the film and you look at the quality of it and the cinematic, uh, you know, aspects of it, the lighting, the, the way that sound plays a role in it. And it's never even a question of who the filmmaker is, you know, physically or whatever. You're just like, hey, they put an idea and quality up on the screen and you would think that's what everybody wants as right. a result. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly, exactly. You know, and that's the problem. You know, the, for me, the real sort of sadness about what's kind of happened. And I have a lot of black friends that we talk about this a lot, about how our careers are not where, where they think, where, we, where they should be compared to our white compatriots, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, the, uh, you know, I, we're not asking for favors. We're just asking for the opportunity. Do you know what I mean? We're just asking to get in the room. Do you know what I mean? A lot of times you don't even get into the room. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times, and it isn't a form of, you know, my point about all this is that people aren't, People aren't sort of overtly racist. It's not what it's about. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is that people hire people they know and hire like, right? So if you're going into a showman who's, uh, who's experienced and he's been doing a show for ages, he's going to know 200 directors uh, uh, that just like him that are going to deliver what he wants. Why are they going to hire me who's risky? Do you know what I mean? It's it's mm -hmm. it's all it's it's not it's I don't I don't I don't sit here and go you know these are people that are bad people. No, these are people that yes probably have an implicit bias, but you know the, the same thing happens and so. You know, to get a film, right, you know, from my perspective, is so, so hard, right? It's so hard, so much harder than the other thing. So everything has to be right. So number one, I have to look at a film that's got distribution, or so I'm not going to look at it. So this did, right? Paramount are involved. Tick. Number two, do I have a realistic chance of, of getting the film, i.e. is the warm, is the room warm? Well, it will be because they want a black director. So that means it's gonna, I'm going to have a, a real fighting chance of getting it, you know? Mm -hmm. Number three, Number three is thematically, does it resonate with me? You know what I mean? And if and and so it's it's I've waited years for this film. Years, right? Years. The last time I made a film was 10 years ago. 10 mm. years ago, right? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 10 yeah. years ago. That film made $66 million and opened at number one. But I took me 10 years to get a film. What does that tell you? Do you see my point? Yeah. Do you know what you mean? You know, and so I can understand. You know, uh, specifically for spell. I got the impression it was a South African production, looking at the credits. Uh, is that the case? And what drove that? Uh, uh, you know, it's all about, for me, it's all about time. You know, my job is really kind of, I, I always look at like an equation, you know, um, you know, it's, it's kind of about geometry in a strange kind of way, you know, it's, it's all geometrical for me. And so, uh, you know, I knew with something like this that, you know, I'd need time, you know. Um, I also knew as well that we would need um, coverage. So for the first time I shot with three cameras, which, mm. which, which I've not done before. Um, and, it, it, and I'm at the moment, and I, and I brought it into this job. I'm now, we're now shooting with three cameras on, on the job that I'm on at the moment because of the film that I did. And it's, it's a really great way of shooting because you know, you've got two ways of doing it. You know, everybody can be on, you know, on wide lenses. Everybody can be on a you know, 21, a 28, and a, sorry, 21, a 29, and a 35, or you can go 21, 50, 85, right? So you can do close-ups to wides in the same, in the same, in the same setup. The problem with that is that sound have a problem because they can't get in because they're in the you know, you know so so you, you you know you have to sort of like pick your battles but but for me for me you know number one i wanted to go somewhere where i could afford to have three cameras so when we did the math in america and canada i got 25 days right i couldn't do i couldn't make a film in 25 days but in south africa with the exchange rate and i've shot there before i shot an episode of doctor who there uh, i know the crews are great it it it, it 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 you know i got 35 days right so i was okay. like oh God, right, this is where we have to go, right? We have yeah. to go to South Africa because I can get I can get the bandwidth to, to do this properly, right? You know, mm -hmm. we could, we built we built those sets, right? I couldn't do that in, in North America, right? I couldn't build those sets, you know, we, we did all of that. And so for me, that was it was kind of a no-brainer, right? You know, the difficulty with that was finding somewhere that had the same feel as you know, Virginia. And yeah. that was the that was the real yeah. that was the real struggle. But we did a huge my my designer. Paula Luz was brilliant. You know, she did a lot of research and we made sure that we got it right. You know, everything and the detail in it is amazing. I think the department at the art department out there was amazing. Yeah, and they really are. The, the, the craftsmanships out there are brilliant. I mean, they're so high. So, you know, um, I didn't want to do that. If I'm honest, with you, I didn't want to go to South Africa because I wanted to try and sort of tap into the kind of Americanism of it. But it was the only way that we could get the film made uh, mm -hmm. with the sort of scope that I wanted to. Now, you mentioned uh, shooting with three cameras, and I know that you're shooting yourself sometimes uh, in, with other projects. Are you 
aware of or do you have a preference as far as camera format camera models or is that something your director of photography will dictate or suggest how familiar with the technology or influenced uh, by it are you i'm really familiar with it you know i'm operating at the moment you know um i'm operating at the moment and the reason why i operate is because it it, it avoids uh, three or four levels of communication and in the time that we have like now with COVID time times where we have 10 hours to 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 make our day it helps, you know, trust me, it really helps, you know, with the actors, you're talking right to them. But yes, I mean, you know, at, at the moment, you know, we, we, we you know, I, I usually don't use the Alexas because the Alexas allow me to kind of bump up frame rates. I can go 48, uh, 98, and I can go to 200, I think, with the Alexa. With the Reds, not so good, you know, and we use the Reds on, on Spell, uh, but lenses are really my thing. You know, for me, the lenses are really important. You know, we're using Zeiss at the moment, and we're using some, uh, we're using uh, the Corvius lenses as well for kind of like in, you know, intimate close-ups. Um, so Spell, was it both Alexa and Red or just one no, of them? No, no, spell, spell, we, spell we shot in the Reds with the Primo lenses, Pan, 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 Panavision Primo lenses, which are the wide screen Panavision lenses. They've got 70 mil sensor on them. Mm -hmm. So the widest, the widest lens you're gonna get on that is a 27 mil, but that's about the same as a 14 mil lens in kind of like, you know, prime speak. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so that gave us that sort of like widescreen effect. Now, the irony is, if I'd known that you know we were we were gonna this was gonna happen to the world, I would have probably chosen different lenses, you know, because the film is designed to be looked at on the on the on the on the, on the big screen. You know, when, was, when did you shoot, and when was post finished in comparison to like the twenty twenty time frame? Was this a twenty nineteen production that finished before the pandemic? Yeah. Or was it yeah, we just finished. I just literally, I was starting to shoot now this year. And we finished in December. I flew back right there in December and we went straight into posts. And I was really happy. You know, I was on the lot. And, it was, you know, it was, a, it was a kind of lifetime achievement for me to be in the Paramount lot. I was at an office where, where Howard Hughes just used to cut in. You know, I was like, this, is, this was it. I just kind of like finally made it, you know, especially to my family. And then we got shut down because of COVID. And then we had to edit from remotely. And that became a very different animal because you know, uh, executives are watching it on an iPad, right? And they're mm -hmm. watching it with, with interference, right? So they can press pause, they can answer an email, they can do what I just did, you know, I can, they can text someone really quickly, you know? Yeah, yeah. They don't, they don't see it as arrested, as an arrested audience, like you do in a cinema. So we lost that, you know, we lost that. Mm -hmm. And that's a big, big deal. You know, ordinarily we'd have screenings and they're there and they have to sit and they have to watch the film. They can't be on their email, they can't be communicating, they've got to give it all this attention. And we also lost, and this is really important, we lost testing. We did test once, right? But we lost that, we lost that ability to, to, for, for the audience to experience the film in a community, which is how you're supposed to experience these sorts of films, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Feeding off each other's energy. And so, so post was really difficult, but my post team, I've got to really give them a big shout out of, of Sarah, Sarah Reeves, who was my principal editor, and uh, Tommy Bernard, who was kind of our assistant, and, and my I post team. credits. Yeah. Now, yeah. You were in South Africa for the production, and I know refinery, refinery was providing uh, dailies. Was that going back to the States? Was there post-production taking place in Africa or the UK or something? How, what was the post-pipeline there while you were sh shooting for those 30 years? The rushes all came back straight away um, immediately. Um, we had an issue with with the with the with the widescreen format, and we had to we had to kind of like work out what our crop rate was because that was that was a problem um, because we didn't we, we didn't have the budget to basically convert it down to 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 the to the, to the right sort of aspect ratio. So once we sorted that out, we were good. But the only real post that happened in South Africa was our visual effects team, and they were a team they were a team called Motif. Again, brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. My head of post-production at uh, Paramount is a wonderful woman called Stephanie Ito. And she said to me about them, she says, um, uh, and Stephanie Allen, who's head of VFX at Paramount, she said to me, oh, you know, they're so user-friendly. And that's probably the best phrase I've ever heard about describe. These guys were brilliant. You know, I would come back to them with kind of, you know, you know, version 10, and they would still, you know, be like, yeah, no problem, we'll, we'll change it, you know? How many visual effects are there in the film, shot oh. count-wise? Is it more? Yes. Yeah, I mean, Sorry. there's obviously a lot of different sequences. There's the plane sequences that you'd have to think. There's the physical, you know, a bloody aspect of it. I mean, how much is it that the audience may not be aware of? Because it's not science fiction effects necessarily, but you do have those flashback sequences that have to come together yeah. with an effect. So there's lots. There's lots. I mean, you know, I feel quite bad because I sort of, I kind of allocated. I went through, you know, when I when I pitched in the job, I was like, there's only 89 visual effects, and I listed them all out. And eventually, we went up to about 278, you know, visual effects, which is a lot. 
yeah. and they were they, they, you know they are from fire effects to smoke to you know to to to, to wire removal you know to mm -hmm. all of these sorts of things that add up that people don't realize you know what i mean you know uh, to 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 yes you're right the, the the plane sequence you know you know all of that stuff and the plane sequence was in terms of it there's a lovely shot where the plane gets hit by lightning that was actually done by my my assistant editor tommy who's brilliant and tommy sort of did this and he was like what do you think and i was like that's fantastic and so he sort of did a rough of it and then sent it to Motif, who then sort of like, you know, worked off his kind of like work, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's what for me was the best thing about it. The post-production process for me was probably one of the most pleasurable experiences I've ever had. I mean, you know, my boss, Ashley Brooks, um, the boss above us, with Godfrey, who was running, running the studio at the time, they were brilliant. They kind of said to me, make the film that you want to make. And everybody supported that, you know. And the music, I don't know if... I don't know if, if, if if you kind of notice it, but the music is amazing, you know, by Ben Onono. I noticed that music, sound design, and lighting all play, yeah. as with any horror film or suspense film, they're important roles. Do you want to talk about that with the original music? Sure, sure, sure. I'm going to try and show you something if I can here. Um, you know, this is the this is the um, this is the spell bible, right? That we have that's over 147 pages. If you ever want to check it out, but if you if you have a look, you know, for me, there's a whole section you know uh like this is this is a thing that i call the mood burst like that's a photograph uh there, there and 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 you know and these are all the sort of images that i call mood burst that uh, you know like if you look at that i mean you know the, the couple right i mean mm -hmm, you think mm -hmm. of the film right you know and that's that's um gordon parks um his photography so for me you know uh, uh, uh look it's all about story Right? It's all about story for me. And anything that I can do to extend your story is what I will do. I don't really give a shit what that means, but I can't get in the way of that, right? So I can, I'll never say to you, if I was working with you, hey man, let's do this shot because it's really cool. I'd, I'd expect a slap in the face. If I said to you, let's do this shot because it extenuates how the character's feeling, it's a different argument. Yeah. So that's always what I think you've got to remember when you do these shots. And for me, it's all about the light. And if you look at the film and the set, especially that, that the, the, the attic set, Look at where the windows are. You know, there's one behind him, and there's and there's a doorway behind her because she's standing on opposite ends of the bed. They're, they're both on opposite ends of the bed. There's a doorway, and down the down the down the stairs, there's another round window. So so the two the two windows on either end are round, and the windows above are square. And it, again, it was really important for us to kind of to kind of work on that and to work on where the light would be and what the background would be and what the depth of field would be, mm -hmm. but where the par where the parallel lines are. Because for me, parallel lines are really important where you want the audience to be. So if you have a camera and you kind of have it on sticks, you're not using the lines on the floor. But if you put it on a floor on a sandbag, suddenly you use the lines of the floor, the lines of the wall and the lines of the ceiling. And the eye is drawn right to where you want it to. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So for me, for me, the camera, the placing of the camera, the movement of the camera, you know, the feel of it, you know, we did a lot of handheld of this. We didn't use any steady cam. I noticed that. I noticed that there was a lot of handheld when he's in the bed, a lot of the close-ups of his face, it's, you know, moving yeah. around and stuff. So yeah, yeah it's noticeable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As far as the editorial goes, working with Sarah Reeves, was she working behind camera, like within a day or two or a few days, or did she get it all at the end of, uh, once the shoot had wrapped up? What was, how close to production was she? Her process is the process that I have on every job that I do, even the job that I'm doing now. And I, I ask for the cuts uh, at the end of every week. I ask for what we've done that week cut by Friday. And then I try and distribute, uh, distribute that to all the people involved so we can see where we're at. So what she was doing, she was cutting in real time. So she, she would literally say to us, we need this. And I'd go, okay, right, we need this. We need to pick that up, right? So all the time she was kind of like always kind of filling in the gaps that we had missed, you know? So she was constantly on, on it, you know, the whole time. And so it meant that by the time we finished, we finished, we had a cut of the film that was actually three hours, 15 minutes long. Oh, wow. And the film's only an hour and a half, essentially. So you really had to right. condense that and do a second right. editorial. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I, again, I, I really got to pay homage to my bosses at Paramount. They were like, this is a 90 minute film, Mark. You know what I mean? And that's what we've got to go for somehow, you know? And again, I have no problem killing my babies. Go on, sorry. So you kind of knew it was going to be 90 minutes one way or the other, that it was going to have to come down. It wasn't just yeah. open-ended. It could be two hours. It could be, you know, okay. Yeah. yeah, I knew, I knew, you know, just instinctively, you know, I'm really, if I'm honest with you, if I'm honest with you, I'm going to repeat the word honest now. I'm a very honest filmmaker, right? You know, when people say things, even if I don't want to hear it, I kind of go, ah, that's right, you know? And even when they said that to me, I was like, ah, you know what, they're right. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of, but the great thing about it was we had so much footage the trailer we could all put it in the trailer you know it's mm -hmm. like we had, and i love that idea that actually 
people see the trailer and it's not what's in the film. And I really like that. I sort of go, that's great. Cause everything now is all delivered to you and there's no surprises, but actually there's a lot of stuff that's in the, that's in the film. Like this, I don't know if you've seen the trailer, there's the sunken bed bit where, you know, they sink into the bed. That's not yeah. in the film, right? Yeah. Do you know yeah. What I mean? yeah. That's not in the film. How did you get it down to the final 90 minute cut? What was the uh, collaboration with Sarah Reeves on the editorial? Were she then working independently and you would check in weekly or daily at some point? Or how did you finally get to cut it in half, essentially? It's a great question. You know, I, 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 I believe in fresh eyes, right? So I don't sit in the edit room and go, okay, do this, do that, do that. I don't do that that, that way. I literally say like cut, I, get, I cut and then come in and I go in and I see it and I just give notes. I don't even call them notes. I hate that word. It's prescriptive. I give them thoughts. I say, look, here are my thoughts. And I give her all these thoughts. And then that's what we did. And so that's what I kept doing. And then only towards the end of the process did I did I did I say to her, did I sit in the room and sort of you know go through it? And then I do a thing where I go through every every single rush, every, every, um, every daily. Um, and I look at these little moments and I go, right, I want that in the film. And you would, I mean, you, uh, an example of a really good one is in the barn sequence, there's a shot where Eloise comes out of shadow and sort of goes to the old man and it's two seconds. But I, I go through and I pick those little moments because they're the moments that I really love. And I pick little bits like that, the bits of faces that maybe she might have missed because she's been working on telling the story. And I call it the veneer pass where I then lay in these kind of like little sort of atmospheric sort of little snippets of things that mm -hmm. I know that I really love. A lot of the time she's got those because I think, I think the, I think a really good editor, like a DOP, gets in your head and works out what you like and why you've done it. And, you know, and, and they kind of extrapolate those pieces. But that's what we did. So we sort of do a sort of like, we do a pass, we whittle it down, we get it into shape where we are. And then we come in and we kind of like, you know, um, do this veneer pass. And then we sort okay. of like get it all complete. And that's kind of how we did it. Is she working with an Avid system? Adobe yeah. Premiere? It is Avid. Yeah. She was, she was working with Avid. They were both working with Avid. Tommy did a, Tommy did a lot of editing. He did, he did quite a lot of editing that we bumped him up um, to additional editor because uh, I think he did such a great job. You know, mm -hmm. uh, great, you know he's a great, he was a great assistant and I really hope that now he becomes his own editor in his own right. He deserves it, you know? Amazing yeah. Cyclopedia. Yeah, he's got amazing encyclopedia knowledge of films. I'd say to him, Tommy, what's that film that did this, this, and this? And he'd go, oh, that's one of You know, he's just, you know, one of those guys, you know? Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. In hindsight, I know that you're pressed for time, so I don't want to drag it out, but uh, in no, hindsight, no, did the film turn out the way you had envisioned it initially? Obviously, you start with a certain vision in your mind and ultimately you deliver a product. Is it close to what you had envisioned? Did it evolve along the way into something different? <laughs> That's a great, great, great question. It's a great question. I don't think, you know, um, n no is the answer because, and I don't think it ever will. I don't think I'll ever get to that place, right? You know, it's like, it's getting closer. You know, mm -hmm. I, you know, I talk a lot about this kind of pilgrimage that I've been on to kind of develop a visual language that's my own, right? You know what I mean? You know, I know that when I watch a Fincher film, it's a Fincher film. Like I know when I hear, you know, a Mark Knopfler riff, that's Mark Knopfler. You know, I know, you kind of know people mm -hmm. that have got a stamp or, or, or a perspective of the world, right? No matter what it is, through sound, music, books, whatever it is, you couldn't know. And I've always wanted that. I've always wanted my own sort of perspective, you know? And so one of the things that I've tried to develop very much is, you know, is a thing that I call off on off, which is where I do a shot, say of your face, off the eye line, below the eye line, and then I come on the eye line. So I earn the close up, right? You know. So what I'll do is, it's a bit like boxing. I won't go for the haymaker punch. I'll sort of soften mm -hmm. you up with some body punches. So we'll go wide, wide, off, blow, and then on. So we've earned the close up. And that's a language that I've been sort of like trying to sort of like develop for a while, you know, and trying to develop, trying to develop, you know, at the moment I'm really into very much, and this is different, this is the point. Um, I'm very much into now practical lighting, you know, so less hard light, less mm -hmm. film, but more about practical lighting they've set up and more about using those as hard or soft, but lighting the floor so the actor can go beneath, go in and out of the light. And, and so, so already, just from spell, I've already sort of developed, you know, the job that I'm on at the moment, again, you know, um, I've got a lot of kind of like input into the look of the show, which is great. And we've developed a system that, that, that I've wanted to develop for ages called Catch and Release, which is we have a crane and the camera is on the crane and it comes down and then we've developed the system where we then take the camera off the crane and go into a, a Ronin shot, right? Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the link is seamless. But what it, what it allows is, is the viewer is suddenly, is suddenly objective and they become subjective, right? They, they, it's this really weird effect that it does to the viewer. But they shouldn't notice it, right? But the catch and release system is something that we've developed on this job. You know, we made, we made, the, we made the rig on this job. 
Okay. Now I'm trying to do the I'm trying to do the reverse of it, which is really hard because you see the you see the hick, and you know, and it's got to be safe. The hard thing is about the catch and release. It's got to be safe because it's gonna it will if it's not safe, you know. So it's quite hard to get it back on. So for yeah, me, yeah. so for me, it's part of this evolution of of how I see the world and what I'm trying to do. Now don't get me wrong. In spell, we got a lot right. You know, there's a sequence where she's putting up the clothes. Mm -hmm. And I shot, I shot all of that apart from the crane, right? I shot all of it. And it's very, very much how I wanted to do, uh, it's very much how I see the world, right? And so we use the 29 mil with the diapter one. So which meant that minimum focus was about, you know, nine to 13 inches, right? So it meant that, and I, even last night I was, I do it, the focus puller, instead of sitting offset like this in a box, I have them right beside me and they're just holding my jacket and they're pulling me in and out of minimum, right? because I can't, then we don't ruin the take. And they'll just pull up my dress and I'll go up and then I'll go, okay. And then I'll, I might, you know, I might veer in again and it's off and then he'll pull me out again, you know? And we did it last night. Joe was pulling me in and out because we were on, we were on 85 mil lenses and, and I kept the minimum is about, uh, it's less than two feet. I think it's about one foot, one foot, it's about wow. one and a half feet. And so I kept going into minimums. So he kept pulling me out, you know? Um, and so, so for me, like, you know, like I said, now I'm in this very different space. You know, I know that now if I look back at Spell, I'd go, mm, I would like this differently now. Do you know what I mean? And, and right. then a year from, if you ask the same question a year from now, I'd go, oh, you know, I'm not really into soft and hard light anymore. Here's what I really want to do, you know? Um, so well, when you refer to what you're on now, is that the lock and key uh, project? Yes, yes, okay. I was going to say, what's next for you? Are you uh, committed to that for a stretch? Do you have other stuff lined up? Yeah, I'm doing Lock and Key, and then I'm doing David E. Kelly's uh, new show, um, which I'm really excited about because I've always wanted to work with him. Um, you know, he's great. Uh, and then I do the series finale of a show called um, Mysterious Benedict Society. And then I come back to do the season finale of Lock and Key. Um, my Lock and Key family uh, have been very good to me. Um, they really trust my instincts and really trust, you know, trust kind of what I do with the camera. You know, how I work is very unusual in that I operate, you know, very few directors do it, you know, um, in TV, in TV. Uh, and they're very, very understanding of it and, and really kind of really support it, you know. Um, and so, um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what I do. And I'm hoping that the film does open up channels, especially in, in, in film for me, um, um, just because, you know, I love TV and a lot of my influences coming from TV. But, you know, for me, you know, I love the I love the idea of film and, mm -hmm. and I, I'm really I'm really I really want to try and stay there now, now that I'm back in it, you know, uh, and not have another. I don't be talking to you in 10 years time going, oh, well, remember that film? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope that I hope we can talk again in the future about some of the work that you've got coming down the road. I know you're you're busy and you've got to get to set for the next project. But I want to thank you for uh, sharing your insight with our audience. I know the post readers will definitely appreciate it and they should definitely check out Spell, which is going to open later this month, October 3rd. Next week. Next yeah, week. Okay. Yeah. Next week. Well, it, opens, yeah. it opens today theatrically and then it opens a week um, on video demand. So, Very yeah. Cool. You know, there's, and there's, there's a huge amount of uh, behind the scenes that I think your audience will find really interesting. A huge amount, you know, obviously with three with a three hours 50 cut, we've got a lot of uh, a lot of scenes that kind of ended up on the floor. But uh, yeah, so yeah, I think they'll enjoy it. Definitely worth seeing, especially having heard from you now about some of the aspects to look out for. So hopefully we can talk again in the future. Mark, thank you for your time. Thank, thanks a lot, man. Thank I you. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate Take it, man. Care. Thanks a lot. Take Great. care. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Mark.